just a, a quick note here. Um, we got a lot to cover, so I'm going to get into it here shortly. Uh, but uh, we we thought, you know, listen, with with the craziness that's going on in the world right now, and uh, of course, our heart goes out to everyone who is uh, affected uh, health wise uh, by this uh, by this virus. There's a lot uh, that is going to impact our industry. We're going to get into that. Um, so we just felt like, uh, look, people were going to be uh, at home, maybe with some more time on their hands, and thought it'd be useful to launch this work from home webinar series, where we're going to cover a variety of different topics in and around the space that, that we cover uh, and spend time in. And, uh, and hopefully this is uh, of, of value to, to you all. I am beyond thrilled to launch, not only to launch with sort of Stream Wars, because it couldn't kind of be hotter than right now uh, in the uh, streaming space. And I think there's a particular implication of, uh, of sort of the corona scenario, uh, how that'll play out and the effects on, on television to be talking about this particular subject and to have the incredible uh, Rich Greenfield uh, join me for this. There is really no analyst that kind of gets this space better um, that does more uh, homework, that has more of a pointed opinion and point of view uh, as to what's happening, who are the winners and losers are going to be, uh, than Rich uh, and his new firm, uh, Lightshed Partners, which we at Luma are uh, thrilled to partner with on a variety of, of topics, M more to come on that. But really, R Rich has got his finger on the pulse. So thank you, Rich, for joining us. Thanks for having me, Terry. We're very excited. And it's sort of amazing how well this technology seems to be working. Uh, we're both new at this, but um, we've got a lot of people who've got a lot of questions. This is clearly a crisis moment in time. And so I think it's, it's great to be able to reach out to people. We've got over well over 400 people now online. Why don't you get started with the presentation and then we'll hop into Q&A. Absolutely. So, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a deck now. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to sort of go through a, a presentation and then uh, Rich and I will sort of uh, mix it up and, and talk about uh, what we see going on. Um, all right, uh, Rich, are we uh, looking good there in terms of the presentation? You look perfect. Yeah, that's what she said. Um, okay, so Stream Wars and the Future uh, of TV, the inaugural uh, Work From Home webinar series brought to you by Luma. Um, all right, once again, so here's the agenda. We're going to talk about the consumer perspective, the media perspective, the sort of digital tech perspective, uh, uh, and then media strategic response. And then we'll finish with winners uh, and losers. Um, so let's just launch right into it, shall we? From a consumer perspective, what's going on in television could probably be described as a consumer nirvana. Never have consumers ever had the quantity of choice in terms of content, channels, and packages uh, of content to consume. Not only do they have quantity, they've got great quality. Um, so this past year, the primetime Emmys were dominated by streaming content, 40 Four percent of all Emmy wins were streaming content. Seventy-one percent, if you include uh, HBO, and then finally, lower price. The uh, combination of streaming packages are materially lower than the traditional cable bundle. So, in summary, the the consumers get a win, win, win. This is uh, just a wonderful uh, scenario uh, for them. So um, that's great for the consumer. From the media perspective, we are at least 10 years into the narrative that TV is dead or dying. And I suppose all you have to do is uh, look at the demographic decline in the last 10 years with the key demos being down 25 to 60%. That is to say the younger, uh, higher purchase uh, intent demos that advertisers love are down materially in terms of linear TV watching in the last decade. You may conclude that the economics, therefore, would have been uh, crushed in TV as well. Well, not so fast. If you recall your Economics 101, uh, um, price is set at the intersection of supply and demand. Well, the pullback, the reduction in linear viewing of, of, of TV is tantamount to sort of pulling back on supply. And when you have inelastic demand, all that means is price goes up. So the TV industry has actually 
answered the reduction in eyeballs with an increase in price, which is why it has been stable at $70 billion and is projected to stay relatively stable for the next few years, subject to change. Um, so we looked at, uh, with that kind of stability, what are the drivers of linear TV? And as it turns out, 87% of all linear viewing is live. And 89% of all live viewership is sports, with the majority of that being the NFL. So with the NFL playing such a key role in the economics of linear TV, we decided to take a look at the contracts. This is a summary of all of the broadcast rights for NFL uh, uh, slots. And a couple of things to note here. Number one, all of these contracts are up for renewal in the next year. So we are right at the nexus of when uh, this is going to be uh, redecided. Secondly, is take a look at the size of the AFC contract for Sunday football. Uh, the last contract renewal is a nine-year deal is $9.2 million. If that contract gets renewed at the same increase as the last increase, then it'll be $17.2 billion. By the way, prior to uh, uh, corona, it, uh, most analysts had estimated that it would go up even higher. So that's a $17 billion commitment by Viacom CBS. Well, they only have $900 million of cash on their balance sheet. So I would describe the sports question for linear TV broadcasters as beyond existential. By the way, they're fully committed to it. They just signed Tony Romo to a $17 million a year contract for three years, extendable for another seven. Should they renew that for the entire uh, period, we're talking about another $170 million plus commitment. So let's take that off. And now we're down to only $700 million of cash on the Viacom CBS balance sheet. This is, uh, like I said, beyond existential. And it's no wonder they have to defend their turf because big tech is moving in, right? Amazon licensed co-exclusive rights on Thursday night to the NFL, and they licensed the Premier League in the UK. And my supposition is that if big tech gets serious about sports rights, uh, they could really score. By the way, we're gonna have lots of fun during this presentation. Jeff Bezos knows the power of what having a tuned in audience the NFL can do for prime customers and driving his, uh, his core business of e-commerce. And besides, he's even interested in an NFL franchise. So I think, I think we'll see more of Jeff uh, in the future. All right, admit, there, well, this was a slide that I had up until three weeks ago and it said, Re recession fears for 2020 are unfounded. Sure, we got geopolitical tensions and global trade turmoil and manufacturing weakness and a litany of things that one could be worried about. And there was a lot of discussion, if you recall, at the end of last year, are we headed for another recession? And this was a slide where I said, no, it's not going to happen. Uh, um, you know, the election, the Olympics, everything is going up, at least in advertising. I think we now have to amend this, obviously, for Corona. Now, the recession fears are probably not unfounded. They're inevitable. What a change in, just in the last month. And we'll get more into that later. I would, if, if, if we don't hit a recession this year, and I'm pretty sure we're heading that way, think about 2021, non-election, non-Olympic, non-World Cup year. So if, 20, if Corona doesn't get us, 2021 will. So what is being disrupted? Well, there's approximately $160 billion worth of economics in, linear, in the linear TV bundle, split between paid, advertising, and affiliate fees. Well, in a streaming world, how will that change? Paid will drop to SVOD. It'll be a smaller number, materially smaller. We'll get into that. Advertising likely also to shrink as it moves uh, to AVOD. And affiliate fees just drop out of the sky. They don't exist, at least in a terms of the existing retransmission uh, uh, way uh, of the affiliate fees in a streaming context. Let's double click on advertising, if you will, and take a look. Pull out the adding machine and let's add up what will happen to the advertising pie when we move to TV, to CTV. Well, we got start with $70 billion of linear TV ad economics, as I just mentioned. Well, to that, we're going to add for the fact that we're going to be able to target and personalize, which will, based on what's happened in digital, produce higher CPMs. 
also to add is that we're, you know, the democratization of TV that results when we're able to target will create a long tail of advertisers that will come into the TV channel that heretofore hadn't, hadn't been there. So those are two positives. What we're going to reduce for sure is the loss of what I'll call mass reach water cooler moments. Not just sheer quantity in terms of reach, but watching the same ad at the same time, right? If we all watch the same show, you get a Doritos ad and I get a Volvo ad and Susan gets a, a, a progressive insurance ad. Well, we don't, we're not gonna talk about the same ad. So you lose that sort of water cooler moment. It's hard to define, but it's sizable. Also, we're going to lose inventory as people shift consumption from uh, advertising supported media to SVOD. And we've already seen uh, a lot of that. And then finally, there'll be some additional efficiency loss due to the tech uh, take rate. Uh, just witness how much uh, more is taken from digital buys versus TV. So you add it all up. I don't know what the number is, but I'm pretty sure it's less than $70 uh, billion. The trick for big media the incumbents is that they have to swap out the engines while keeping the plane in flight. So as we go from TV to CTV, there's over a trillion dollars worth of market cap to protect. So it's not as though we can take revenues to zero and build them back up again. So that's the media perspective. Now let's think about tech. Well, we know that the digital channel is now the largest channel. It's surpassed TV, that was two years ago, and it's now 130 billion, 100, projected to be 150 billion uh, this year and rising. That's the good news. The bad news is it's dominated, as we know, by the triopoly of Google, Facebook, and Amazon, which take garner about two thirds of all of this spend. Well, uh, a big, a big uh, trend, headwinds are coming though for big tech in the form of the tech lash. It is really a enhanced scrutiny on a variety of issues against big tech. You can hear the voices. Anybody in here a little worried about how Facebook uses your data? Freedom of speech is not freedom of reach. I think Mark Zuckerberg is the most dangerous person in the world. So everyone from, it was originally CMOs piping up, uh, talking about uh, issues with big tech. Now we got, former presidential uh, candidates, uh, outspoken university uh, professors, and now even comedians are getting in on the act to chastise big tech for these issues. And the manifestation of that has been twofold. One, privacy regulation starting in Europe, now here in the United States, potentially additionally more with more state uh, regulation coming on board, and antitrust. We have seen record fines, again, starting in Europe, now coming to the US, uh, basically 48 state AGs along with the feds are investigating, you know, Google and Facebook. So there's going to be heightened acquisition security of that group. And not only that, it's starting to slow in the digital channel. So what do you do if you're a big tech platform and your sort of native channel is starting to slow? Well, you move to new channels and every single digital platform has uh, an initiative in television. They have a TV offering. These are not comparable, but they're all investigating and looking at the big uh, TV opportunity. That's not to say it's easy. Take a look at Google. It has not been easy to disrupt this world. Sure, they've got some big successes with YouTube, um, and obviously dis uh, DoubleClick plays a, plays a major role, but think about it. They are, they've got major fails as it relates to intermediating linear uh, ad spend. So, this isn't as easy as it was in say music or print where the digital giants are going to absolutely just walk over uh, the existing uh, incumbents. Now, I'm gonna say this isn't a fair fight, media versus tech, right? There's only a handful of media companies that have garnered market caps of like 200 billion or more. <laughs> and they've ballooned up to like in this group, $1.2 trillion trading at an average of 3.4 times revenues. Compare that to big tech though, and there is no comparison. Collectively, I know you thought that was gonna pop. Uh, um, collectively, this group has 4X the market cap and almost double the multiple. I'm, I'm sorry, this is dated data. This is as of the end of February. If we update this for yesterday, yeah, a lot of air has come out of those balloons. We're now down to sub a trillion, 
for big media and their and their multiples cut down to under three and big tech still larger uh, about uh, three and a half times as large at 3.3 uh, trillion. Take a look at how small the market caps of some of the most storied names in media. Viacom, CBS, the combination of the two companies at eight billion dollars, barely making a blip on the x-axis compared to some of the tech giants. So look, this is not a fair fight. Uh, and, and you could cast this as a battle of offense team red versus defense team blue and a battle it is. Take a look, they're obviously uh, set up with different tactics to, to compete and win, but, but just take a look at this, would you? Here's the lineup of sort of offense, defense, team red, team blue, in the United States. Now let's go to Canada, the United Kingdom, Germany, Australia. It doesn't matter where you go around the world, the left-hand side of the page doesn't change. The big tech giants are competing on a global platform, which is why they have an unfair, another unfair advantage in the sense that they are able to amortize their tech, data, and content investments over uh, the, their global network. This is not, ladies and gentlemen, a fair fight. So with tech coming into television and dramatically outscaling them, uh, what is media's strategic response? We think it's threefold. One, scale consolidation. Uh, we have already seen in the last three years, uh, two, a quarter of a trillion dollars worth of combinations, both vertical and horizontal, as big media and telco vertical into big media try to garner the same kind of scale to compete against big tech. And I don't think we're done. Uh, I count at least 75 to $100 billion of more sort of companies in play, if you will. Uh, I think uh, coronavirus just uh, found its latest victim in Tegna uh, as uh, Gray Advertising dropped their bid just today. So there's, there's yet more to come and it's understandable. Now, it isn't just M&A, uh, we are seeing these media companies literally holding hands, or virtually holding hands, I should say, in co-ops, co-ops for data and co-ops for inventory, hope you appreciated that little throwback, um, uh, to, in order to recreate and garner the scale uh, to compete against a big tech. Second strategy is direct OTT distribution. Look you have to be able to provide your content in a manner in which your consumers want to consume it. And yes, while we've had streaming options for 10 years, uh, it's really in the last year where we've seen Apple, Disney, AT&T, and Comcast launch their major streaming properties. And look, they're leaving nothing to chance, right? I like to say the streaming warriors are down with OTT. They're bringing A-list talent signed up for specifically the streaming uh, channel. And they're not leaving anything to chance in terms of the launch. They have successfully launched all of these platforms with cross promotion deals that almost ensure uh, the success of the launches because they know what marketing's most effective strategy is free. So with all the cross promotion, no wonder why everyone's signing up for these packages. So far, they haven't had to pay for them. Some have said that the success of these new brands could come at the cost of the existing streaming brands. We don't believe this is true. This is not a zero sum game and we think multiple streaming brands can, can thrive. So, however, it is a war and wars have casualties. This streaming war has already claimed two uh, casualties and I'm pretty sure that before we get to the end of Streaming Wars, every single gravestone in this image will have a logo on it. Why? Because there's too much fragmentation. Think about it, right? There's not enough room in the wallet for consumers to consume to multiple, you know, endless numbers of subscription packages. All you have to do is ask the consumers. They'll tell you that how much they're willing to spend. And all of these stats, and regardless of the source, uh, are materially less than the ARPU, the average revenue per user of the basic linear cable package, which is hovering around a hundred bucks. So that's why we know that SVOD ARPU will be materially less than the linear package. 
which is why we're big fans of, of Avod. Uh, yes, the fanfare of SVOD in the last six months with all these launches has sort of sucked up all the oxygen in the room. But at the end of the day, I think where a lot of the play here will be in advertising supported video on demand. And that's certainly something that the NBC folks with their launch of Peacock, that's primarily Avod, are also counting on. Well, this fragmented world of streaming also produces a problem, a problem of discovery for the consumer. You can't remember on which channel your great new show that you streamed the other night uh, is on. Uh, it also creates an opportunity, an opportunity of re-aggregation. So my suggestion is that there is a huge opportunity here for a scale technology company that doesn't have media conflicts and yet has great UI to be able to re-aggregate the top of the funnel. Let's see, scale tech, no media conflicts and great UI. Anybody come to mind? What would you like to watch? Exactly, we believe that Cupertino is after this big opportunity. And I wouldn't be surprised to see them change their app from 499 to zero in order to garner that. Why? Because they know there's tremendous value at the top of a waterfall, whether it's the app store, or search or commerce, Apple knows that being at the top of the waterfall of a big ecosystem like TV will garner huge uh, uh, economic opportunities. It's not as though they'll have this to themselves, right? You've got the OEMs and the cable guys, all, they're all limited to their own footprint, however, and I'm gonna suggest that it's also an unfair fight. Big tech has huge advantages. Third and final uh, trend that, uh, or, or uh, plan uh, of big media in their sort of defense battle plan is CTV technology acquisitions. Now, this perhaps comes with a caveat. You know, Luma is an investment bank that intermediates CTV technology acquisitions. Uh, and we often call for more M&A because when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, okay, so with that said, obviously the big opportunity is to apply the digital attributes of targeting personalization, attribution, and performance to television where you've got sight, sound, and motion, audience and spend scale, premium inventory, and brand safety. That's the opportunity. If we're successful in doing so, we will essentially democratize TV spend as previously mentioned. Think about it. CBS has 200 advertisers. Compare that to Facebook, it's got 7 million advertisers. I'm not suggesting CBS is gonna have 7 billion customers in advertising. There, I, don't think, I don't think there's enough martini glasses in the world, uh, to, given the way they sell to, to make that work. But the point is there's gonna, you know, a CTV targeted uh, uh, TV ad world will open up a whole plethora of long tail advertisers for uh, the television channel. But there's a tremendous amount of complexity. Think about the principles at either end of the spectrum. You've got marketers and consumers, either both of which view this world holistically and simplistically. What do I mean by that? Well, consumers think of it simplistically. They consume TV regardless of the device. It doesn't matter to them that they're coming across four different distinct CTV channels of linear, addressable, OTT, and digital video each with their own delivery protocols, identity parameters, workflow. These are all very, very different technologies. Now, to the marketer, they need a holistic, their nirvana would be to have a unified, standardized measurement to plan, buy, analyze, and attribute advertising free of fraud. Think about it. They have to manage their campaigns holistically to the consumer, regardless of which channel or which device the consumer happens to be consuming it on. Even simple things like frequency capping are hard to do unless you have that holistic view. So how do we get there? There's a lot of complication here. I am not suggesting this is gonna happen overnight. In fact, our estimated timeline to achieve this is, well, let's just say it's gonna take a while. And there's one thing I wanna point out. <laughs> we absolutely must not succumb to the issues, the horrific issues we had in the digital channel, fraud, viewability, measurement, the list goes on and on, and have that infect this new big opportunity of CTV. There's my little PSA. So uh, obviously CTV requires technology. That's why we have the convergent TV Lumascape that maps companies that intermediate uh, across linear channel, uh, addressable linear, uh, OTT, 
uh, digital, and of course the data providers that make it all work. The analogy we use is glue. This is like glue uh, that hold, binds all of this stuff together. And look, it's worth it. It's worth the complication because this is a huge market, right? Think about it. You've got linear migrating to OTT. You've got a hundred billion dollar market growing substantially. And at least in prior forecasts in the next year, 50% of that will be addressable. So this is why there's a real there there in terms of the CTV trend. There's a lot of trends I tell marketers to maybe take a pass on or wait until it becomes more leading edge and less bleeding edge. But this CTV opportunity is a big one. So no wonder why there's been so much activity in CTV technology acquisition. In fact, in the last year, $2 billion worth of acquisitions, including yesterday's uh, announcement where Fox is buying Tubi for $500 million, and which we'll get into, a tremendous amount of activity as big media uh, gar you know, does these acquisitions to garner the kind of technology necessary to compete against big tech. So who are these acquirers, you ask? Well, you could come up with a smattering of logos of companies that might be interested. We think of them in categories of digital, platforms, media, TV distribution, data, cloud, and hardware. These are the 32 logos of the strategic buyers we think are gonna be making the biggest moves in this space. And finally, let's end with winners and losers. Let's light this candle. No, sorry, not, not you, Scott, uh, thank you. Uh, we'll do our own winners and losers here. Uh, we're going to do it by category. So brands, let's think about it. This ought to be good for brands, right? More choice after they get past the learning curve, as long as we don't have those digital you know, issues that plagued us in that channel. Uh, for the agencies, this is good because complexity equals margin. We saw that with programmatic. For the tech intermediaries, same thing. Complexity is equal to margin. There should be more take right here. For big tech and data, this is all good, right? This is basically newfound opportunity for them and a really, really large market. Um, for media distribution, this is our first down arrow because look, uh, while there will be some mitigation with ISP revenues for the cable folks, uh, we believe that net net, these guys are gonna be way down. There's no way they'll replicate the bundle uh, economics in a streaming world. You saw that uh, with the ARPU uh, uh, analysis. For media content, you know, we're gonna we're gonna go with neutral, but but it really depends on who you are. Yes, these are arms dealers, so they'll sell their content regardless of the distribution channel. However, there are some names that clearly will not be able to uh, maintain the economics they had in in a in a bundled world. And an obvious example that comes to mind is ESPN. They've been they're uh, they've been the beneficiary of non sports viewers who have been essentially paying for. Uh, their service, their channel in the bundle and, and been supported all along. Uh, that obviously won't be the case in streaming. So, so it depends on the name. And then finally, we're going to end where we started, which consumers. And for them, this is all good news. It's more choice, better quality, and lower price. So that's sort of uh, our take on uh, winners uh, and losers. So uh, I thank you for that. We are now uh, going to uh, open this up and move to uh, questions and answers, where uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to go ahead and end this share, this uh, uh, stop sharing. There we go. There we go. Uh, now I get to see uh, Rich uh, as, as much as Rich as, as I care <laughs> to see. Uh, by the way, we did say pants optional. I do want to point out. I am in yeah. fact wearing pants and I won't ask Rich to stand up because I'm pretty sure he's not. Um, so uh, let's see, we're gonna, I'm gonna open up a Q and A here and uh, let's see, um, I, I tell you what I'm gonna do, Rich. I am gonna go to a couple of, um, there's a couple areas I want I want to get to with with you. First, I want to get your take, and then we'll then we'll grab grab the audience uh, questions. So uh, it, let's go at a very very high level here. Big media versus big tech. That was the sort of the thesis of yep. of of my piece. Give me your sense of how those two uh, are going to compete with each other, and and who's likely to come out ahead. 
Well, I mean, look, I, I think from a, a very high level, sort of the fundamental issue is that linear TV time was already in free fall. Uh, we were already expecting double digit declines in, in TV viewing. All of the, you know, really all of the shows that consumers are excited about were coming to streaming, whether it's Netflix, whether it's HBO, whether it's Hulu, there was really nothing that you would look at that was like, wow, in terms of linear television, you know, Disney Plus put Mandalorian on Disney Plus, not on Disney Channel, not on ABC. You know, NBC is doing Dr. Death, which is one of those big podcasts from Wondery, uh, you know, and that's going on to Peacock, not on to NBC prime time. And, you know, you see this over and over again, the best content or the most ambitious, I shouldn't say best, but the most ambitious content was already heading to streaming. So I think there's no doubt that from an entertainment standpoint, the clear winner is technology uh, or the tech platforms, the direct to consumer platforms. Now, interestingly, the, the big tech companies that you mentioned don't really seem to have much of an appetite for video outside of Amazon and Apple. The pure ad players, meaning Facebook and Google, don't really seem to want to get into traditional TV like content. And look, from an advertiser, we could certainly have a whole nother debate over whether you should care whether the content is Mandalorian-like or pick your favorite show on Hulu or whether it's YouTube. I think YouTube, you know, the ad team at, at Google would say, what does it matter? You just want eyeballs. Obviously, there is a, a safety and you talked about all the brand safety issues and some of the security and there's a premium nature to TV that I still think benefits advertisers, I think it's probably why Fox just bought Tubi yesterday, is that you want brand safe places to put inventory online, especially on big screen devices. But you know, you've got two companies in Amazon and Apple that are obviously making big inroads. I think Amazon obviously ahead of, 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 of Apple and obviously Amazon is the only one that has an ad play in this. Apple, Netflix, obviously ad free. Amazon, right. I think IMDB TV, I think you're gonna see get a lot more ambitious over the course of the coming year. But I think the reality is for consumers, there really isn't, um, you know, I don't really think this is a battle from a consumer standpoint. I think the, the reality is, you know, everyone likes to say streaming wars, but it's really all of these streaming services are going to win. People are going to take Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime. I mean, you're not paying for a lot of these things either. You're getting Amazon for shipping. You're not getting it for Prime Video. You're buying a new iPhone you're not signing up for Apple TV Plus incrementally. I mean, some people are, but the vast majority, these are essentially included with other services. And so the reality is the shift to on-demand TV is unstoppable. If anything, I think in many ways, what's happening right now in terms of the pandemic and people being stuck at home, is it gonna increase TV viewing? Absolutely. Like we saw some stats uh, over the last couple of days where TV time spent is up double digits. I mean, there's no doubt that people are spending more time watching linear TV, but streaming is up even more. And Verizon came out with that, and I think 12 or 13% rise in, in streaming video. So there's no doubt that people are streaming more during this crisis. So I, I think the one thing that really, uh, where I would you know sort of pause is really on the sports point, because we really haven't seen the tech platforms. If they really wanted to destroy the legacy TV ecosystem, you need to see that the Apples and the Amazons make very big bets on sports programming. And so far, now this could change, but so far we haven't seen any, what I would call, huge move in, in that regard. Obviously, there's a football contract that's coming up for bid, but we haven't seen anything that I would call game-changing out of big tech. You know, I always think about it as a Jenga game in that you've got this, you know, the last piece holding up the Jenga game is sports and nobody's been willing in the sports world to pull that last Jenga piece just yet. Right, right, which, which and we came, to the, we came to the same analysis. What about originals? How, how big a role does original content play in the success of these streaming channels? Because it varies widely. No wonder, you said Mandalorian, it's no wonder they put it on the Disney Plus channel is because they, they need subscribers. And it seems to me that that's very attractive for customer acquisition. New content is what drives people. I mean, you see it with Netflix day in and day out. You know, Netflix is now publishing their top 10 uh, every single day in every major country. You're being able to get a live look at what's happening on Netflix. And there's no doubt that fresh content is what's driving it you're seeing all of the shows, you know, they dropped two movies over the last few days 
uh, Spencer Confidential, and uh, I think it's called Lost Girls, both of those in the top five. And people really want fresh content. And I think that's going to be one of the real challenges for Disney with Disney Plus is that they were really relying on their movie pipeline to fill the void from not having a lot of originals. So when a movie went into its TV window effectively, its pay TV window, you right. used to see that on Netflix. Now they were going to put it on Disney Plus. But now with movies not coming out and even productions being halted, and they didn't, unlike Netflix, they didn't have a stockpile of shows. Netflix has lots right. of stuff stockpiled. So right. stuff keeps rolling out from all over the world. That's going to be a real challenge for Disney Plus. I think you're going to see sort of, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if growth slows. Yes, people are home more. I don't think there's going to be a lot of churn because families are stuck at home. You're going to want to turn on the library for kids. But without new fresh content, uh, it, it does start to get stale pretty fast, especially for anyone over the age of 15. Right, right. So, all right. So it's a, it's a war where, um, where consumers win. Uh, lo lots of lots of choice, uh, original content uh, being being key. Uh, what about this balance? And by the way, uh, for everyone who's submitting questions, we're coming to Corona. Um, we decided to put it late in the agenda because otherwise it'll just take up the, the whole thing. But we are going to address the, the Corona impacts. Um, just a quick uh, uh, snapshot of your uh, perspective, uh, Rich, on um, subscription versus uh, AVOD. Where, where, how do you think that plays out over the years ahead? Look, AVOD, if you go back to the original days of TV and even radio, right? I mean, ad supported content is nothing new. And, you know, when you look at, actually, if you, if you turn on an Apple TV or a Roku, Yes, the number one most used app is Netflix, but the number two app that always surprises both media executives and investors is YouTube. Ad-supported video right. is number two. And it's been that way for years. It's nothing new. So the concept of whether AVOD and whether you call it fast, you know, kind of free ad-supported streaming services, as Alan Walk coined that term, whatever term you want to use, there's no doubt that there is a meaningful place for, for these services. And I think that's why you see Comcast buying Zumo uh, why Fox just bought Tubi, why Viacom bought um, Pluto TV, why Peacock is launching an ad-supported version. You know, I think the, the, the reality is there's a role for all of this. And you think about it, $70 billion of TV advertising. We'll get to what the pandemic means for all of it. But there's no doubt that $70 billion of TV advertising needs to go somewhere. Now, a chunk of it's going to go to Google. Obviously, YouTube's already a $15 billion business growing rapidly. Uh, but the question is, where do all these dollars go, especially if you care about brand safety, if you care right. about kind of big screen environment for this content? And the answer is, we're not sure. I mean, Roku, if you think about it, Hulu is a $2 billion ad revenue business. Roku, call it, you know, if you look at platform revenue and you take 75% of it, you know, it's six, $700 million. Tubi, Pluto, Zumo, you're barely over $3 billion right. of ad spend, unless you include YouTube. And remember that 15 billion is global. The, the overall numbers just aren't that big. And so I think everyone is looking at how do we put more dollars to work in AVOD uh, slash FAST? And, and I think you're going to see a lot of dollars go there. Now, will they be anywhere near the scale of something like Netflix that has 160 plus million subscribers? I just don't think you can scale any of these businesses to that scale. Now, Fox spending $500 million on on um, uh, on uh, Tubi, Viacom spending $300 million on Pluto, we may turn around. These may be very good investments, especially with the amount of unsold inventory they have and the big ad sales forces that these big tech platforms or these big media companies have. But that's very different than are you creating in Tubi or in Pluto? Are you creating, you know, $100, $200 billion businesses? Right. I don't think so. I, I think we're at a very, very, you know, you looked at that chart you had before, the shift from the old world to the new world. This is better than nothing, and I understand that, that, why they're doing so, it. So, so the, you're saying the plane is going to lose altitude. It may not look, fall out of the sky, but it's going to lose altitude. Look, I'm, I, I, there's, a, there's, I, I always think of the quote from Peter Chernin that there is no business as good as everyone in America paying for content where most of them don't want it. I mean, you think about ESPN, 100 million people at the peak paying $8 a month, where only a small fraction, you know, probably 20% or less of people actually wanted that channel. That's an amazing business. Nothing will replicate that business model. It's yep. just simply not possible right. to replicate that business model in a streaming world because presumably, Terry, everyone listening, we've got, what, 430 people on right now. Presumably, of those 430 people, 
however many have Netflix, I presume none of them have Netflix and actually don't want it. Whereas right. lots right. of them right. have a cable subscription and don't want ESPN or don't want Discovery yeah. or don't want right. CBS. And that's the fundamental problem is nobody pays in streaming for things they don't want. Again, this, this narrative of zero sum game, I think is kind of ludicrous, right? I mean, Netflix is not going anywhere. And if anything, they'll be the rest of world distribution for every major uh, US uh, broadcaster, maybe save, save Disney, because why would HBO want to build out an infrastructure in India? Or why would Peacock want to build out a Nigerian streaming platform? Netflix has already done it. So they'll be a natural international partner. I want to I want to go to uh, before we move off linear. Um, you know this notion I identify, you've identified, everyone's identified sports as being you know this critical component. Uh, with the new contracts coming up in 2022, and you know given what's going on in particular now, do you see any of the tech platforms being far enough along? Whether it's Amazon or YouTube, I gotta imagine those are the only ones capable of being able to buy a, a big package on TV, or do you think they'll continue to experiment and big media will, will continue their uh, contracts if they can? Look, I think all signs are that Facebook has no interest. I mean, I think you've seen Facebook really pull back pretty dramatically. I think Apple, surprisingly, you know, I think Apple has the dollars to do it, but I don't sense a lot of interest. And remember, they're not in the advertising business. They don't like advertising. Eddie Q's been very vocal on, he doesn't like ads, his family doesn't like ads. He doesn't think his consumers like ads. And so he's not big on ads. So that makes it hard to justify the cost of sports. And remember, you know, look, would sports put Apple TV Plus on the map? I mean, having Monday Night Football would, or, you know, having Sunday Ticket would absolutely put Apple TV Plus on the map. And look, maybe they'll go there, especially with a premium package like Sunday Ticket. But I think doing the, the linear packages is much more difficult because of the lack of advertising. And that's just not where their head is at. And so I'd be surprised if they went in that direction. Right. That leaves two big tech companies. You know, I, again, I don't think Netflix has any interest in advertising. They don't do advertising. So that really leaves, you know, you're really looking at Amazon and Google and especially Google vis-a-vis -vis YouTube TV. Those are probably the two tech platforms that I could see doing something more significant from a sports standpoint. I mean, Amazon has done more in the last few years than anybody else on the sports right. side. And so I think they are a highly likely bidder for a major sports package. I wouldn't be surprised. Sunday ticket would fit perfectly into right. Amazon. Uh, you're seeing Amazon getting more ambitious. They're bought apart part of the Yes Network. I mean, they definitely seem to have larger aspirations. Yep. Google, I mean, look, if you think about the model of DirecTV, it was, hey, you, Terry, you want, you want Sunday Ticket, you have to buy DirecTV. And so it wasn't just getting value out of Sunday Ticket. It was kind of that, that um, indirect value from being a subscriber to DirecTV. So it was additive and building upon that. YouTube could do the same thing. They could say, hey, if you want, you, if you want Sunday Ticket, you have to be a YouTube TV subscriber. Now it's, a, it's probably a $2 billion plus expense to do it on an annual basis. And so it's not a, something to take lightly, yep. but I, I do think that that's one way you could create indirect value and really create meaningful economics is by sticking it into YouTube TV and making it an add-on much the way, you know, if you think about the way UFC is an add-on for pay-per-views for, right. for ESPN plus, it sort of follows that model. And look, ESPN plus could certainly be a bidder. It's a big number and Disney's got a lot of troubles right now. So that may be hard to digest in this environment, but you know, I do think that there's a chance that you do see some of, of the packages go to digital players. But again, Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, I think all of those are going to broadcasters. The NFL right. wants reach, and right. the only way to get reach is gonna be through television. I agree, so, so I agree. And, and I guess the other question is, not only do the economics still probably make sense for, for media to do the next round of major uh, sports rights, I'm not sure we're there yet from a technology standpoint. Thomas Eaton uh, asked a question about, you know, forget about economics, guys. What about uh, simultaneous viewership? I mean, we've seen crashes even with the biggest of companies. YouTube has crashed on live events where you get mass simultaneous viewership. We know that OTT is still kludgy in many respects. Um, I think the folks at Fubo have done an amazing job of building their back end, but uh, we're still talking small numbers compared to linear TV, who have had the last 75 years to perfect their technology. 
Although I will say we're getting a pretty good live look at video streaming capabilities of the internet with basically the entire world working from home and using things like Zoom right now. And so we're, we're, I, we're, we're, we're real time demonstrating the. Uh, yeah. So I, I look, I, maybe views on this will change. But look, I do think that even you know, if you were talking to the MLB, NFL and a NBA, I think all of them would have concerns. You know, you think about the biggest NFL game of the week in terms of viewership is the 425 national game of the week. You know, if you stream that game on Facebook or Amazon, any of these platforms, uh, you know, look, my gut is Google could handle it. And Google probably, if they were on this call, my guess is they would say they could handle it. But again, until you actually try it and you have that type of simultaneous, you know, tens of millions of people watching for three hours, um, you know, it's never been tried before. So we honestly just don't know whether you could do something of that scale with good picture quality you know, my guess is that gets solved over the course of the next four or five years. And so maybe the next contract, it becomes more possible. But, yep. but Terry, the, the bigger problem is people are not tuning into digital for, you know, all the time. You know, people still turn on the television on Sunday right. for sports right. and flip between games. You know, people are just not in the habit of going to Apple TV+. Plus. I mean, I do think they're in the habit of going to Netflix. Like you come home from work and you turn on or come home from school and you turn on Netflix or you even watch Netflix in school, but don't tell anyone. But the reality is you're not in the habit of turning on Facebook or Google or Amazon for sports. And so until these companies build up enough sports content, it's sort of a chicken and the egg that the consumer isn't thinking about it. And so the only people that are gonna go watch sports on streaming are gonna be diehard fans. You're not gonna get the casual fan if the NBA shifted from TNT to Facebook, you only get casual fans on Facebook, whereas, the, you know, you, sorry, you're only going to get the diehards that are going to go search for that game that yeah. are on Facebook. You're going to lose the casual viewers that were flipping through the dial. And I think that's very worrisome to these sports leagues. With, um, with, the, with the long tail um, of these, these streaming platforms, you know, I talked about there being too much fragmentation. There's going to be lots of casualties. Do you have a rule of thumb in terms of number of subscribers, a animalists, uh, uh, Milicevic uh, uh, asks about, you know, is there a sort of sustainable, um, S, you know, subscription level of, of customers for it, for it to be viable? Well, I mean, look, Avod, obviously the costs are much lower. You know, you're, you know, a lot of times you're, you're doing revenue shares, although I think with the competition in Avod, one of the big things that no one's really talking about is that you're starting to move to having to pay and actually license content at a fixed fee versus being able to do it on a rev share basis. And that has very big, you know, um, profitability implications to all of these AVOD platforms. And it's not really being talked about, but it's absolutely happening that there's just so much AVOD demand in the last six months that you're starting to see the studios say, hey, no more revenue shares, pay us up front. Right. Uh, you know, in turn, the cost of this actually does mean you need greater scale. And so in some ways, these companies being consolidated makes sense because they're gonna yeah. need greater scale to compete for yep. the licensing of content and not to mention bigger balance sheets to yep. take on ownership of these titles. Well, uh, I think on, on an S5 basis, I mean, look, if you can't get to tens of millions of subscribers, uh, it's actually, it, it's not just a subscriber number. It's obviously an ARPU issue. You know, you think right. about people were like, I, I've gotten the question in the last few days, just put Mulan on Disney plus don't even put it out in the movie theaters. Like movie theaters are closed. Give us Mulan right now put it on Disney Plus. But Terry, the problem is Disney Plus is $6.99. It's really hard to all of a sudden include a movie that you think can do a billion and a half dollars globally, and you're just gonna put it in a service for $6.99. Now, if Disney said, okay, new release movies, no more theaters, we're going direct to consumer at 15 to $20, dollars you have got a whole different story. I mean, obviously Netflix is doing it with you know a $13 price point upwards of $16 price point. Six ninety nine. That's heavily discounted down to you know. I think the ARPU for Disney Plus last quarter was five fifty. The math just simply doesn't work to make that type of rapid shift right now. Uh, and so I think that's why you're not seeing the studios put their big blockbusters. They're basically right. just delaying them, saying we'll not come yet. back to this when we can. Right. Although we'll yeah we'll we'll see if uh, when we get to Corona whether whether that that impacts things. Just by the way, time check with folks. We're um. We're six minutes away from the top of the hour. We're going to keep going. Um, so, you know, stick with us while we're still, you know, hashing out uh, good, uh, good content. So speaking of that, those combinations, we've got a question. Is there a buyer for Viacom? And let's see, it's coming from an S Redstone who asks, is there a buyer for Viacom? That's pretty funny. 
Uh, look, I think the question is Viacom shrinks um, in market cap. I think there's a lot of fears around its parent company, National Amusements, and its own liquidity. Uh, it's a movie theater business, obviously, it, it, with movie theaters shut down and, and only a few hundred million dollars of debt. So National Amusements believes they're safe, but I think part of the crisis here is that National hasn't come out publicly and talked about their safety and liquidity situation. And I think that's impairing Viacom shares. So until National says something, Viacom is going to be under pressure uh, based on that fear. Your question is, is, could there be a buyer? Look, I think if Viacom was willing to sell itself at this valuation, there would be a long list of buyers in the industry who would be looking to take advantage. Despite the crisis we're in, I think people would take advantage of it. The question or the problem is, I don't believe that the Redstone family, National Amusements actually, you know, in terms of the parent company, I don't believe National is a seller, especially at this price. National is going to do everything in their power not to sell. Uh, and so I think it's very unlikely, but I do believe that if this thing was put up for sale, there would be value, you know, multiples of where Viacom is currently trading. Actually, if you think about how many different pieces, if you were to break this up, a studio, cable network, broadcast networks, digital, there's a lot of stuff in there if you were going to break it up. I'm just not sure that that's going to happen. Here's here's a great question, um, and that is with um, you know we've we've seen CTV is a big trend with streaming uh, direct to consumer. We've seen a lot of brands grow share uh, rapidly. One of the biggest problems for many companies is they don't know who their customers are. So CBS has no idea who consumes CBS because of the distribution intermediation. Um, somebody uh, asks anonymous uh, asks the question. Do you think large sports rights owners will go direct to consumer, like play Premier League, you know, basically launching their own streaming capability with their own brand, going straight to the consumer, bypassing the intermediary, and obviously they're relying on those distribution rights right now. Is there a way to sort of bridge the two so they don't have to go cold turkey when they switch? Look, it's a scary world out there right now um, in terms of potential recession and, or maybe we are in a recession already and, and pandemic. So you're talking about owners, team owners, uh, leagues, reaching into their own pockets and spending money on technology, marketing, customer care uh, to support a direct to consumer streaming business. I don't wanna say it's not possible, but I would be highly suspect of that happening, particularly in the current environment. The, the reality is the NFL was sort of the test case for this, right? I mean, they launched the NFL yep. network and eventually realized that NFL games on Thursday night on the NFL network was not as good as putting them on broadcast TV. And number one show on broadcast TV in prime time every week is Sunday night football. Number two is actually not Monday night football. Number two is Thursday night football right. on Fox. Right. And so, the power of broadcast from a reach standpoint, you know, I think that was a great example. If you want people to play your sport, people need to watch your sport. If you want people to be engaged with your sport, it needs to be available. And the reach that's available on, on television relative to doing it in streaming, I, I think the, it, it honestly just doesn't make sense to go direct. Maybe there's certain packages, you know, you know, but again, even something like Sunday Ticket, I think is very hard to justify going direct for, for the NFL. Do I think that they could make the NFL network available more broadly? I mean, look, it'd be great if we could get the NFL network off of TV and into digital. I mean, imagine if you could get the NFL network as an add-on to Amazon Prime. That would right. be really interesting. But as in an add-on, so that's the key. You got to go. You got to yes. go cold, cold exclusive, right? You can't. You can't just go cold, cold turkey. You you mentioned Thursday night, and and obviously Twitter two years ago co-licensed uh, co Thursday night football. You're a big Twitter bull. Uh, where do, uh, you, you're currently, you, you got a buyout, right? We do. I mean, look, I think Twitter is sort of a unique beneficiary. I mean, if you think about time spent. But, but are they, what, do they have an opportunity in, in sports streaming? It, like they're, they're, let's just be clear. In Q4, for like, like, let's just look at the last quarter reported was Q4. Uh, Twitter's advertising was, was, you know, call it what, uh, a tenth of Facebook's? I mean, you, you know, you're, you're sorry, 20th of Facebook's. I mean, you know, it's, this is still such a small company um, in the scheme of if it's ad spend. I just don't think they have the types of dollars. Can they do little things like they did where they, you know, I mean, a simulcast contract that cost at that point tens of millions? Sure. Uh, did it financially make sense? Probably not at this point. I mean, it, I think it was important back then to kind of reinvigorate morale around Twitter. 
But you know, my guess is, is Twitter is becoming an essential utility for people knowing what's going on around them and, and around the world and, and it, it sure new product launches. That. It sure seems that this week, right? I mean, you, yeah. if, if the Academy Awards are on, something live is on, uh, Facebook is a, is a ghost town, a ghost town, and everybody's on Twitter talking about what's going on. It's all in real time. And, and then you get a scenario like now, it's like, I guess it's a mixture now, but when, when things are in the immediate moment, it feels like Twitter owns real time relative to any other channel. And, and look, so are there advertisers under pressure? For sure. There's no doubt that Twitter has advertisers under pressure. Is travel and leisure a big category? No, but you know, is Japan important to them? It's a double digit revenue is, is Japan for, for Twitter. So yeah, there are definitely worries points for Twitter. But if you think about, look, there are lots of things. I mean, you're not driving in cars to listen to radio. You're not passing billboards right now. You're stuck at home. Twitter has got to be growing time spent, has to be growing ad impressions. And I would yeah. think, you know, especially if you think about you know, how you reach people during a crisis, what better way for brands than leveraging a, a, a mobile platform like Twitter? Yep. All right. So there's so many questions uh, around uh, Corona that, I mean, we've been holding this off folks for, for a reason, because once you go there, you know, do you ever, do you ever come back? We're going to finish with winners and losers. And for those of you, there's still 330 of you on, if you stick to the very end, we've got a world premiere comedy uh, content coming. So uh, stick around. I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll have some fun. Um, I want to talk about Corona now, uh, both in terms of the primary effects. Obviously, we're going to have this, you know, health as the virus moves through whoever it's going to infect and whatever the consequences of that will be in recovery, there's going to be a healthcare effect. And obviously there's an immediate effect of uh, closures, retail, travel, uh, uh, TV production is now being limited. I saw that Ford is closing its production. So there's going to be immediate impacts and then there's going to be a sort of secondary longer term um, impacts. You wrote a blog post this morning. Can you give us the thumbnails of that and, and what's your view? Uh, you know, the thumbnail is who in the world knows, you know, trying to predict advertising, tr what happens uh, in a recession, we sort of know. I mean, we can look back to the prior recessions and we can see autos pulled back sharply. W you know, we can see that food and candy were, were up. We can see that telecommunications were up in the last recession. Uh, pharma was up in the last recession. Uh, you know, and, and ad spend fell, but it didn't collapse. I mean, I, I don't want to right. mitigate a, a down high single digits, but it, TV advertising certainly didn't collapse in the last recession. Here, we're in a whole new ball game because one, not only are we moving into a recession or we may already be in one, but we've got a pandemic that we don't know how long it lasts. We don't know how long people are stuck in their homes. And then the crazy part of this is that the biggest part of TV advertising or the piece that draws brands most to television is live sports. And there's no live sports essentially anywhere on planet Earth right now. Uh, and so for, from that standpoint, we're sort of in uncharted territory. I mean, look, you can certainly look at, you know, we pulled up the top 60 advertisers on TV over the last 12 months. No surprise, autos represent you know, 11 of them. I think, you know, if you look, if I look at the numbers here, we've got, um, 12, sorry, 12 of the top 60 advertisers are autos, 11 are quick serve restaurants, seven are insurance mortgage, seven are retail stores, and six are movies and streaming. You know, in the movie studio category, the only thing that's probably okay uh, are Amazon Prime and Hulu and things like that. In the, you know, in the retail stores, other than Amazon, they're probably all getting hurt. Maybe insurance is fine. You know, we saw last weekend, the big advertisers, Geico, State Farm, were all advertising aggressively. You saw Telecom, T-Mobile, and Sprint were still top 10 advertisers last weekend in the midst of this. And you've seen new advertisers step in, which is interesting. Facebook was a top five advertiser last weekend on, on television, across all of television, running spots tied to groups. And so to me, it looks like Facebook is trying to figure out how do they kind of, kind of highlight the fact that people can't congregate in person. Right. Facebook groups is one of the most interesting places on the internet. And I think Facebook is trying to grab mind share and, and basically highlight the power and importance of Facebook groups during this time of global crisis. And so, you know, it's very hard to figure out. I mean, obviously ad spend is going to go down across all categories. 
right. the real question is how long does this last? I think if this is a six week, we're all, we're all locked down versus a, you know, call it nine to 12 week, there's obviously very different implications. And just going back to sports and I'll, then I'll turn it back to you on the sports side, the NBA, again, is not canceled. The NCAA tournament was actually canceled. The NBA is on pause. The NHL is on pause. You know, you talk to the Mark Cubans and, and league owners who have been on TV over the last few days. They're all hopeful of getting the championship on or the playoffs in over the summer. That's still possible that we could have a, call it July, August, NBA playoffs. You're seeing the Kentucky Derby not canceled, but moved to the fall. And so, you know, you could have a ton of sports advertising that is essentially on TV, not killed, just moved from, you know, Q2, our Q1, Q2, over to Q3, Q4. And so that's what also makes this very difficult is understanding how long this lasts. Because I think as soon as people can spend, obviously there'll be economic repercussions, but I would assume as soon as people are allowed out of their houses again, things like quick serve restaurants start ramping up their spend very, very quickly. Yeah, I think from uh, you know from 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 our perspective, I, I think I agree with all that, which is to say we don't know. Um, that said, it it is a function of how long this thing you know will be uh, prolonged. At this stage, right, we're almost sort of all sequestered in our in our homes. If that this lasts more than two months, I mean that's gonna there goes twenty twenty, right? I mean the upfronts are canceled. We don't even have an opportunity for you to be able to buy advertising, let alone uh, the inventory. Um, but it, it, yeah, I, certainly... I'm not even sure you, you think the upfronts even happen in May. No. I mean, I would assume they just no. delay the upfronts. No, I'm not sure there is upfronts for 2020. Um, because the, because the definition of upfront has got to be at the early part of the year, right? I mean, that's the whole right. uh, premise. I mean, I think you probably combined it like what we're doing with our conference. So, um, the, the other thing though is deals. Um, and we're, we're going to have a specific webinar to talk about uh, sort of consolidation trends and the M&A opportunity and what happens in an environment like this. But suffice to say that, you know, deals are a function of confidence, right? You, you would never capitalize uh, uh, your uh, future. It's essentially what you're doing with M&A deal is you're taking what you expect to happen in the future and you're paying for it all today and hoping it plays out better than, than expected. Obviously in a world where there is less visibility into the future, you, you simply can't do that math. There's no NPV uh, that works when things are, are uncertainty. So uncertainty is the enemy of M&A. Um, and we're certainly seeing that already with deals sort of breaking or going on hold as you know companies are just trying to figure out where employees are gonna work and how, what demand looks like for their businesses. So I definitely, I don't wanna give away the store. We're gonna talk about it in detail on that uh, webinar, but um, suffice to say that it's certainly not, not, not a positive. Um, let's talk about winners and losers. We've already talked about Netflix and you're a, you're a big bull there and I, I, I concur with you. Uh, next up, Disney. And, and look, um, let, me, let me preface Disney by saying, I believe that this is a category different than Peacock, different than HBO Max, and different than Quibi, we'll get there, um, in the sense that it really is the only legacy media property with a sufficient breadth of content, you know, across Lucasfilms and Marvel and Pixar and the Disney uh, native uh, properties to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, to matter, right? So it's got breadth. It's got depth in the sense that, um, you know, for if you have any children between the ages of, you know, one and 12, you pretty much have to subscribe to Disney Plus if they make the content exclusive. Disney owns a demo. And so uh, unlike the other media properties, I think they're best equipped to be able to have uh, a go of any distribution platform, including uh, their own. So I'm a bull. I've always thought that that would be a good distribution. I'm not here to talk about the comparative to their cable bundle because they certainly do well in the cable bundle, but just as a winner in a world where we're migrating, let's talk about relative winners. I yeah. know you've got to bug up your butt about Disney, but can't you just right here, right now, for finally say that it's a pretty great company with a big opportunity? I mean, look, there's no doubt that Disney is, you, you, you know, the Disney valuation ha looks very different that I'm looking at my screen right now. 
Disney at $85, where just weeks ago it was at $150. Are you, a buy? Are you switching to a buy? Are you live on our no. webinar switching to a buy? No. Ladies and gentlemen, the answer? No. Um, look, that, I, I that think was, that, that, was, that was my Elizabeth Warren moment. Look, the, 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 the reality is uh, all of the legacy media companies, Disney certainly has the best opportunity to shift to the direct to consumer. And clearly you saw it by the overwhelming success of Disney Plus. But, you know, Terry, the problem that all of these, and it, this is not just Disney, this is Disney, this is Warner Media, this is Discovery, every one of these companies, they're not just in the new world. They're not living. Right. HBO Max is not the only thing. HBO yeah, Max. In both worlds, yeah. Correct. And as you put one foot forward, your other foot sinks lower. And so, right, the faster you make this transition, these legacy businesses that have ginormous profits and were making money, whether people cared to watch the content or not, money just kind of came from heaven every morning. The bundle just dropped money into your pocket. As you move faster and faster, you know, as you add in, you know, a Peacock and you add in HBO Max and you add in um, more and more services, the faster the legacy bundle is going to collapse. You know, we exited 2019 with a 5% drop in video subscribers to multi-channel television. That was before Peacock, before HBO Max. You're basically adding lighter fluid to cord cutting with all of this. And I think with anything, with people being at home and probably being looking for new content to watch and trying AVOD services and trying SVOD services, my guess is cord cutting, while there may not be much churn now because nobody wants to return cable boxes right now, but my guess is as you move through the course of the year that you know churn is going to only accelerate uh, and you know not to mention a lot of these virtual mvpds things like youtube tv and hulu plus were basically marketed as ways to watch sports there's yeah, no sports I, I, and so i would assume i would assume churn is pretty high on these services right now because you don't actually have to have them or don't that, have to that, have that them is, if there's no that sports that have to be the case right it was confounding to me that you know in the year 2019 i met a cable executive that 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 thought cord cutting was going to abate as, you know, people graduate, they're going to you know, subscribe to the cable bundle. I told him, I, 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 what are you smoking? Because I want some of that shit, right? That's some good shit. Right. Because so, so the problem, right. So, so the problem you run into is that you've got this legacy ecosystem that was highly profitable declining at an increasing rate. You're trying to step into the new world. Right. Every step into that new world is expensive and costs a lot of money you know, how much are they willing to spend? Netflix is spending $15 billion on content, which is why they have a lot of stuff stockpiled to roll out over the course of the next several months, especially not just in the US, but all around the world. Disney, you know, you think about after Mandalorian, there was really nothing major until you got to Mandalorian again. Right. And, right. and, so, and so, you know, the reality but, but, is- But hang on, hang on. That's, that, that, that's during a period where you're still, you can still get the Disney stuff elsewhere, right? You really, you really have to look at it two things once we're past all the promos so it's not free so you don't look at customer acquisition and don't look at churn until such time as you get past the point of uh sole exclusivity on that platform otherwise it's sort of you got apples and grapefruits i mean uh, yeah look i look i think we're going to learn a lot more about these services as, as you move through the year now obviously with the disruption caused by uh, by covid it's, it's obviously going to be more challenging to kind of understand what actually is going on and how much of this is just people looking to cut back on things they don't have to have it as, as their own wallets get soft. Right. Uh, you know, I, you know, you look at something like Netflix and it, it feels more like the basic cable of years ago. Oh, whereas, totally. a, a lot, whereas a lot of these other services feel like things that you might add on like an well, HBO I mean, if you're and, financially and, I mean, capable. COVID's like a perfect storm for them, right? Well, everyone else discretionary spend is going away. If anything, God damn it. No, I mean, you'll get rid of a lot of things. I mean, sorry, Junior's going to go hungry uh, for a couple of meals because we got to keep our Netflix, right? Because since you're staying, staying at, staying at home. Um, by the way, to this cable executive who thought that uh, people would resubscribe to the cable bundle once they got jobs and got out of college, I'm like, dude. I said, you know, I'm I'm the CEO of an investment bank. I live at, uh, you know, on the Upper East Side in a penthouse in on the in Park Avenue. I cut the cord. Like I'm Omega Man. If I'm going to cut the cord, you lo you're losing everyone. And I think an environment like this will only accelerate uh, what was otherwise naturally uh, going to happen. Um, the only good news, the only good news for advertisers, to be honest, and I'm, I'm sure we've got a lot of advertisers still tuned in, is that you know cord cutters, a lot of them, you know, I think 50% of Roku households, Anthony Wood has talked about, have antennas. If you have an antenna, that means you can watch broadcast TV. 
you can watch broadcast TV, you can see all the advertisements that are running yeah. on live sports and entertainment on broadcast TV. And so, you know, there's, in many there's ways- There's a pro tip, folks. For $30, you can get an HD antenna. It takes two seconds to hook it up onto your television and bam, you've got basically most half of basic cable. Um, right, so I, I think that's gonna be a big part of what you see as cord cutting accelerates is people are still gonna keep antennas because it's a cheap way, an incredibly right. cheap way to get a lot of programming that you may want. All right, let's do lightning round for, for a bunch of these. So uh, ESPN. I mean, look, they were already challenged. This is really going to be hard on them. And, you know, the big question is, is just how long, you know, for all of these sports networks, it's all just how long does it last? Because if you can bounce back and right. put sports on during dead periods, like there isn't a lot of sports midsummer. There'd be a lot of interest, obviously, to watch the NBA finals in mid-July when all there is really is baseball. And so I think it really depends on just how long this lasts before you can answer that. But obviously, they're in a very tough spot where, you know, all, you know, there's really no reason to advertise on ESPN I, I, until sports come back. I'm pretty sure if you put the USA-Russia 1980 Olympic game, right, the Miracle on Ice, uh, on TV right now, it'd get, it'd get huge numbers. Um, what, about, what about Hulu? Flanker strategy? What's, what's the plan with Hulu? Well, look, I think, you know, Hulu is trying to figure out its identity. I mean, they're putting FX shows on, on Hulu instead of on the FX network and trying to say that FX is now on Hulu, but it's, it's sort of consumer confusing. Are these shows, you know, the consumer doesn't understand that FX is a cable channel. Now it's a sub brand of Hulu. The reality is they should just make it Hulu originals. It's just a confusing element making it these sub brands. All it's going to do is distract the focus of consumer. First of all, no consumer is going to care. They're going to know that Hulu has great content, whether it says FX as a brand for devs or not, they'd be better off just calling everything Hulu and building that Hulu brand and letting the FX brand, no offense to, to John Lamgratz, who's built an incredible brand. But the reality is in the future, I don't think FX is a digital standalone brand. And so you should just monetize it until that brand dies on cable TV and yep. focus on Hulu brand. Uh, All right. you know, and then the question is, how does that Hulu brand go global? That's the big question, Terry. Hulu right now is stuck in the U.S., and I right. think we have to see long-term how Hulu builds out globally. Okay. Um, I think I have to redefine the word lightning. Um, okay, so now next category. No, these are, these are phenomenal, uh, thoughtful, informed answers, so we, we love them. Uh, maybe shorter. Uh, uh, Comcast Peacock and AT&T HBO Max. I put them sort of in a similar category. Mm -hmm. Perspective on that group. I'm going to be lightning. HBO Max is going to be a big winner. More content for the same price sounds amazing. I mean, who wouldn't want to watch all of Friends, all of Big Bang Theory, oh, all of West Wing? It's the most expensive package. So you're saying relative to existing HBO customers, it's a, Max is a no-brainer. You're going to upsize. 33 million people already pay for HBO. Now you're getting even more content for the same $15. Churn goes down, gross ads go up. It sounds good to me. Okay, and, and, and obviously key to that is that they keep the gravy train of amazing original content uh, uh, running with, the, with their telco overlay. Are you watching Succession? Oh, I, I don't miss it. It's awesome. Exactly. Well, so then, you know, there you go. Yeah. And then finally, I know a lot of people have been asking about- oh, Peacock. Wait, hold on. You asked, hold on. You asked yeah, yeah, Peacock. Peacock. Yeah, yeah. Look, Peacock is sort of a, you know, look, it, it's sort of very much in the, in the scheme of the way you, you just saw Fox by Tubi. Everyone's looking for where their ad dollars move to. They need more ad inventory on digital platforms. Linda Yaccarino has far more demand for connected yeah. TVs than she, has, than she has spots to put it on. So she needs more impressions. I think Peacock is a great way to fill that. Is it transformative? No. I mean, look, at the end of the day, it's basically a better version of TV everywhere for Comcast subscribers and hopefully for other firms' cable subscribers. It's not an aggressive SVOD play Right. you know, the way a Disney Plus is. Right. It's basically uh, Hulu all over again. Right, right. We're leaving the most controversial to last. Quibi. It's either, you, you, you could, this is going to be super lightning. Uh, a, it's going to zero, which by the way, or B, they completely revolutionized um, uh, uh, TV content, short form TV content on the mobile phone, and it's going to be uh, a skyrocket uh, slam dunk winner. 
Eric. I don't know. I mean, look, look, I, I, I tend to believe this is more of a winner than a loser simply because great content always finds eyeballs. And, you know, Go90 never had great content. This actually has, I've seen hours of Quibi content. Not all of it's amazing, but I've seen enough that well, there so is- You're moment. the one who's seen hours of Quibi content. Okay. I, I have seen three hours of Quibi content right. in seven minute clips. And it's awesome. It's a lot of content to consume. Look, there are, there's, a, there, there's a comedy show with Pete Davison, um, you know, you know, by the Farley brothers, yep. but Bill Murray guest stars. Like, oh, it's it is be good, really right? good. It's really good. Like, I wanted to see the entire thing. I saw three episodes. Uh, I don't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but, you know, the reality is mobile content, we're all on our phones. We're living on our phones even before this crisis took hold. We're yeah. spending a ton of time. And remember, T-Mobile just bought Sprint. T-Mobile is fully behind Quibi and is going to make it available to their subscribers like they did Netflix. Yeah. Look, this is on Jeffrey. Jeffrey, if he creates great content, yep. people are absolutely going to show up, especially given how many people are going to have it through T-Mobile. But this is really a question of, you know, the content needs to be good and consistent. I don't think there's any video platform that has failed with really good content that people wanted to watch. And so that's where I come out is I've, if the content's good, people will be there. So uh, I, I, I lied when I said that was the last one, but, but is, should any of these streaming platforms launch now? Should they, I mean, Quibi was going to launch. Should they, should they just say, screw it, let's just launch? Like, like uh, Universal just announced that their movies are now available. They're talking about an Overton window. They're, they're shifting the, the content. Overton window uh, is shifting to just dump it all up, up there because people have all this time on their hands. Should streaming, should Quibi just launch now? If, if I were HBO Max, Peacock, and Quibi, I would literally hit the go button next week. I mean, I think you have people stuck at home dying to watch content. Otherwise, you just, all you're doing is seeding market share and time spent to Netflix. Yep. The sooner you I, can get into the marketplace with content. Now look, I don't know how much of the content was fully shot and ready to go, so that makes it hard to know. Obviously these services have a lot of library. I would even soft launch and just say, look, introductory price, we're starting out, here's our, here's our soft launch. There may be kinks, but you have an opportunity while people are literally stuck at home. I mean, I see my kids and what they're doing. I mean, they're technically on spring break right now. and you know, yes, they're going outside a little bit, but they're doing a lot of video consumption. Yeah. You know, you look at the Ver Verizon said that I think video game consumption was up 75% week on week. Yeah. You know, if I'm these, if I'm these companies, if I'm HBO, don't you want to get friends out there right now? I mean, everybody would watch friends. If they could watch it on HBO max right now, they would because be bombing friends, friends. Because friends is like, is it's, it's, it's like a, it's like a warm blanket, right? It's just, it's Oh my just God. I would love friends right now. All those characters. It's like, you know, Seinfeld does well in times like this. We just, we want uh, I hope John right Stanky now. is listening to this because I would love to see HBO Max start next week. I think we could all use a little bit of Ross and Rachel right now. Tony, Tony. Oh yeah, he is listening. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Um, cool. And, and just a, a really, really like Snapchat. Are they going to play in, in this in any way, shape, or form? Well, look. You know, a lot of Facebook advertisers are small businesses, and so I think Facebook is uniquely. You know, maybe Google has a lot of them too. Obviously. You know, Google and Facebook are really built so much, you know, these two companies, these giants. Yes, very distributed all around the world. I mean, I think your slide said seven. I think it's actually up to eight million advertisers now on Facebook yeah. around the world. Obviously, that's very heavily reliant on small businesses, whereas companies like Twitter and Snapchat, look, that was the hope that they were going to build and, and get small businesses and grow from hundreds of thousands of advertisers to millions. But I would actually say that both Snapchat and Twitter are both better positioned because they have a lot less small business advertising versus the national advertisers who are better equipped to withstand this and who are gonna be looking to reach people and keep their brand vibrant. Whereas the small businesses who either are shut down or can't operate, they may pull back out of necessity for a period of time until the economy recovers. So I actually think Snap and Twitter probably at the margin are better positioned to take you, better positioned in the crisis, being more national global advertiser centric than small business centric in advertising. Awesome, uh, Rich. Uh, the the so so I think there's many many more questions, and I apologize to the 42 people who have open questions oh right God. now. I think we're, we're, we we we've kind of used up a lot of our life. We got to the bottom of the of the hour here, and we got a few other things uh, to do. 
Um, so look, th there is a reason why I asked Rich uh, Greenfield to uh, join this live stream. I'm going to go uh, back to my deck now. Um, it's, it should be it should be pretty uh, obvious. Uh, just super well informed. Uh, why is that not broadcasting? Um, uh, super well informed in terms of uh, his understanding of the space and the and the players. Um, it really is uh, encyclopedic. Uh, Rich, where can folks uh, go to get your research? We are lightshedtmt.com. Uh, you know, anyone in the industry uh, is welcome to register. We love having more industry readers. Uh, we're a subscription business for institutional investors, and um, we love chatting. So if people want to hit me on Twitter, it's Rich Lightshed. Uh, and we love debating the future of media, especially during times of crisis. And uh, Terry, I can't thank you enough for, for putting this on on very short notice. I mean, we just started talking about this a few days ago and it, having it materialize and work well with hundreds of people is pretty amazing. We've still got over 200 people online. Yes, and, and by the way, there, there is going to be, a, uh, as soon as I can figure out how to share my screen again, it doesn't want to let me. Um, uh, th th again, we're, we've got a nice crescendo here, folks. So. Don't necessarily leave just yet. Screen sharing has failed to start. Please try again later. Um, I don't really understand that. Um, so uh, maybe uh, just as I'm figuring out this, uh, let me just grab a question uh, that was there. Regional sports networks. Uh, I know you, we could probably have a uh, podcast on that alone, uh, but um, what's, your, what's, your, what's your perspective there? You know, look, regional sports networks are a lot of trouble because as the bundle comes undone, the, the reality is uh, regional sports need the bundle. They need everybody to pay for that advertising dollars. And so regional or sorry for those subscription dollars. And so regional sports are probably the most that you're seeing more and more of them dropped by distributors. You know, Dish has gotten out of the regional sports business. YouTube TV cut back on, on regional sports networks. And so regional sports networks, I think, are in for a very rough go. Without the bundle, I don't know what happens to regional sports networks. And I actually think that leagues are going to start looking for ways to abandon the regional sports networks because they're going to be worried of losing reach that the NFL has on broadcast. They don't have on these regional sports networks. And that's a big problem for NBA, NHL, and MLB. Yeah, I, 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 I don't disagree with that. All right, we got, uh, I think you can see my, uh, my desktop. Um, again, uh, thank you again, uh, Rich Lightshed, uh, Rich Greenfield from Lightshed uh, Partners, independent uh, research firm that probably has one of the best handles on this sort of intersection, I would say, of traditional media and the technology world, which is the exact same focus uh, as, uh, as Luma. You can follow him at Rich Lightshed uh, on Twitter. I'm at T. Kawaja. Um, and uh, just want to mention two things here. One is uh, we're going to do these uh, Wednesday webinar work from home series. It feels like we're going to be in this for, for a bit. Uh, so we're going to do this every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Uh, next Wednesday, the 25th of March, we are going to be tackling uh, identity and consumer privacy. And I'll be doing that with my uh, West Coast partner, Brian Anderson, who is a, a, an all-star uh, authority on things like CDP, identity, and marketing technology in general. That'll be a fascinating conversation once again, Wednesday at 2 p.m., webinar, pants are optional. <laughs>